Boa tarde. Bem-vindos ao Teatro do Bairro Alto. Eu chamo Ana Bigotier e faço parte da equipa de programação do TBA. Queria chamar-vos a atenção para o facto desta conversa, que é, desta conferência em inglês, estar a ser gravada em streaming, estando disponível em direto na nossa página de Facebook e em teatrodobairroalto.pt. Trata-se da primeira conferência do ciclo Histórias do Experimental, que em 2020 e parte de 2021 ocupará o teatro, dando a conhecer episódios e lugares-chave do experimentalismo nas artes performativas entre a década de 1960 e hoje. A partir de arquivos e de experiências concretas, vamos viajar então entre diferentes geografias e tempos, conhecendo e discutindo inovações formais, como a suposta primeira black box na Europa, a ideia de criação coletiva, o foco na interdisciplinaridade ou no processo em vez de no produto, procurando entender política esteticamente, ou seja, entendê-los política esteticamente nos seus contextos de origem e questionando a sua operacionalidade hoje. Eu quero dar então as boas-vindas a Mike Pearson, que nos vai falar de, do Microwee Theatre de Richard Tenkat, figura fundadora do teatro holandês e europeu. Mike Pearson é professor emérito de Performance Studies na Abbey Swift University, onde foi responsável pelo desenho dos cursos de licenciatura e mestrado em estudos de performance, que foram pioneiros pela sua abordagem de prática enquanto investigação. Formada em Arqueologia, trabalha profissionalmente em teatro há mais de 50 anos. Muito obrigada, Mike. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, colleagues here, for the invitation. Thank you for all coming this evening. Anna's asked me to talk about some things that happened a long time ago in a country far, far away. Um, but I think those things were fundamental in creating the world uh, of artistic endeavor in which we, we currently labor. Um, so I'm going to begin uh, at the beginning. Uh, uh, with with uh, I've changed my title slightly from 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 the one in your in uh, uh, in your program anyway. In December 1965, Ritsart Ten a film and television producer and member of the wealthy Dutch textile manufacturing family, opens a theatre club in a disused cow shed next to the farmhouse where he lives in Lunerslut in the countryside between Amsterdam and Utrecht. There's also an art gallery and plans for a publishing house. He calls it Mickery, a combination of his own name and that of his then wife, Mick Savastam, Mick Uri. Of his initial ambitions, he writes, We want to do things here that have not happened or could not happen anywhere else. We want to combine all art forms here. Our theater stroke exhibition room must become a laboratory where artists can work together and where visitors can experience art in the truest sense of the world, word. From the beginning then, Mickery is imagined as a platform for utopian ideals, as a place of experiment and innovation of cross-disciplinarity, of concentrated artistic endeavor, and of the presentation of this endeavor to a public. And he declares his in intentions, quote, to revivify a stultified Dutch theater with imported ideas, to give theater a vitality that can be called ritual or mysterious or spiritual rather than realistic to incorporate the visual arts at a high level into decors and staging, to stimulate the imagination of spectators and spur them to formulate a vision of their own, to take on the chronically resistant class of actors and audience. So Mickery is intended as a kind of entrepot, as a place of international exchange, offering both stimulus and challenge to both spectators and performers alike, involving them as active co-participants in the creation of theatrical meaning. Surprisingly, the program at Lernerslet opens with the first concert on mainland Europe by US singer Nina Simone. It's quickly followed by Mickery's own rather conventional production of English playwright Johnny Spate's controversial drama, 
If there weren't any blacks, you'd have to invent them. Quote, an allegorical string of episodic vignettes confined to a graveyard. Here it is in rehearsal with Tenkata on the ladder and the specially constructed Mickery chairs to the left. Already at Mickery, we can see a commitment to new design. Significantly, I think we see here the continuing influence of Tenkata's own history. At Learners Lert, there's an intimus, the intimacy of a television studio with its restrained acting and small studio audience. If there weren't any blacks, we'd have to invent them, was indeed recorded for broadcast. Then, in 1966, Max Stafford Clark's Travers Theatre from Edinburgh appears with Heath Heathcote Williams' plays Rooted and Grounded and the local Stigmatic. Travis are the first guests from the UK. They'll become frequent visitors and in due course an important influence on Mickery's own later organisation of theatrical space, which is going to be my main theme uh, this evening. For in the empty studio in Edinburgh, the audience are seated on carpeted tiers of seating with wheels that can be moved around and set in different configurations for different productions. In 1967, Stichting Mickery Workshop, as it's now called, stages its own productions of Jeanne's The Maids and The Dwarves. Later that year, La Mama Experimental Theatre Club from New York brings Tom Paine Part One. The company sleeps in the farmhouse, the theatre, and with village neighbours. Audiences of 150 show up, packing the venue. It's the beginning of an enduring relationship. La Mama will eventually bring 12 productions, including Futs, Times Square, and a melodrama play. This first visit by Ellen Stewart's company is a key moment in Mickery's history. After that, it aligns itself with La Mama's commitment to theatrical innovation and it devotes itself to presenting and promoting incoming work from the growing international experimental scene. The nearest available source for such work was the UK, where in the late 1960s and early 1970s, we see the emergence of a variety of new radical theatre practices, all often described under the general title experimental. That's the word we used at the time, but including physical theatre, community engaged theatre, agitprop and political theatre, and multimedia performance. Forms of theatre that were prepared and created through processes of actor training, improvisation, collective devising, and group collaboration in what were often termed workshops, indicating the labour being expended in making theatre. As young independent or fringe companies began to appear, so too, in parallel, did venues to accommodate them. The so-called arts labs, such as here Jim Haynes's notorious establishment on Drury Lane in London, where in 1968 I first witnessed stage nudity in Jane Arden's play Vagina Rex and the Gas Oven, and the studio theatres often constructed as an addition to newly built auditoria, many of which were sited on university campuses. There's a chicken and egg situation here, which came first, the new theatre practices seeking suitable venues, or the new venues encouraging and requiring innovative approaches. One particular aspect of this scene was the development of circuits for so-called small-scale touring, for the presentation of performances of limited scenographic means that could be quickly assembled, installed, and then dismantled in a single day, or at most for a run of three days, with emphasis on the ease of handling and construction of scenic materials. And this, and I am being serious here, was an important factor in the development of these kinds of productions and their distribution the Ford Transit Mark I van, launched in 1965. It provided an efficient and economical way of transporting people and things, 
but its capacity was limited. So the scale of these productions was restricted by the size of the vehicle to what could fit in the rear of the transit. And as Amsterdam was only a short ferry trip away, Mickery became an acknowledged venue on the UK circuit, though the trip was of course complicated at that time by customs regulations, as it surely will again in the near future. In 1969, the People's Show appear as heralds of this scene, quickly followed in uh, by the Pip Simmons Group, the Freehold Company, Moving Being, and the Ken Campbell Roadshow. Mickery provided the first foreign experience for these emerging groups that then began to refer to themselves as international. Appearances at Mickery increased prestige at home, and assisted them in establishing and enhancing their wider reputations. And the generous fees offered by Tenkata helped them to support their program elsewhere. The Americans begin to arrive too from the off-Broadway and fast-growing alternative scene. In 1968, bread and puppets appear with fire. And in 1969, installation artist Paul Theck creates decorations for a tree, wire, and cross, brackets, the procession, stroke, Easter in a pear tree, in the yard. Recorded here in one of Mickery's many publications. <laughs> Though Tenkata's tastes were broad, he was selective in his programming, bringing productions mainly from the English-speaking world. He did include political companies such as 784 and Joint Stock, and new writing companies such as playwright David Hare's Portable Theatre, though no Grotowski and Tadeusz Kantor only once. But increasingly, he chooses to reflect the political uncertainties and cultural upheavals of that period by favouring the provocative and the inciting theater with a strong visual aesthetic, work that often turned up and literally amplified the volume, work that was almost too large in its exuberance for the venue. The Pip Simmons group Superman of 1970, based on the comic book character, was Simmons's breakthrough production, a combination of music from a live rock band including familiar songs and original compositions, a cartoon style and silent movie acting, fast moving action, frenetic choreography, and of large papier mache heads and quote, dialogue that could well fit into the bubbles of a comic strip frame. Simmons's next production, Do It in 1971, which was originally commissioned by the Travers in Edinburgh, focused on the activities of Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, Rubin, and the American Yippie movement. It was an attempt, as Simmons proclaims, to reproduce riot in the auditorium. So our actors ran through the audience in a very obscene way. It featured long sequences of group nudity, with naked performers notoriously handcuffing themselves to audience members just before the interval. Tenkata, I never saw it. Uh, Tenkata would have a profound influence on Simmons, so much so that Simmons moved his company to the Netherlands in 1973. Tenkata encouraged him to experiment whilst also offering severe criticism. You didn't have to be afraid that he would say, don't come back with this shit, recalled Simmons. He gave us a framework even if it was always changing. And this sometimes stormy relationship would lead eventually to the creation of Simmons's masterwork, Andy Musique, a horrific reflection on the Holocaust in which a naked brass band finally disappears in the smoke. At Learners Lert, the hospitality was always welcoming, but the performing conditions, both spatial and technical, were cramped and makeshift. In the single undivided space of the cow shed, with its rough roof beams and supporting pillars, audiences were seated close to the action in the most intimate of presentational situations. 
As critic Yoni Donker observed, a simple wooden platform or a couple of worn rugs sufficed to mark off the performer's space for the audience, who in some cases surrounded the stage on all sides. Adam Mickery was evidentially in the same room with the actors, whom one met in the bar after the performance. This sense of complicity of entering into a conspiracy with the people on stage must have constituted one of the main attractions of going to the Mickery in those early days. So everything here was in plain view and up close. And this had implications for both the nature of the production and the styles and registers of presentation. Simply, the expressive conventions and rhetorical emphases of the proscenium stage were no longer useful. And the pretense of looking into a separate illusionary world over there on the stage completely disappeared. As Mickery's popularity and ambitions grew, the size and ambience of Lerner's Lurt provided, pr proved increasingly restrictive. And the audience was just too homogeneous. It was comprised mainly of those able to travel there by car or drawn locally from amongst those wealthy professionals beginning to disperse to the countryside from the city centre. So to address potentially wider audiences, and to position itself more effectively within the Dutch theatre milieu, Tenkata sought premises in Amsterdam itself. This move also capitalised on the after effects of the so-called tomato action, when in 1969 students threw fruit at the productions of the established repertory theatres and abused their actors, leading to their rapid demise and to the redistribution of state funding. In 1972, after a short residency in the Northern Kirk Church, Mickery moved into 117 Rosengracht, a disused cinema on one of the main radial streets in the city. The cinema official, officially opened in 1913. Interior shots show a balcony and sloping stalls facing a small inset box stage with an illuminated sign for toilets to the left. It also functioned as a variety theatre. By 1931, it had changed its name to the Astor Theatre. An aerial shot of the again renamed Capital Cinema in 1953 gives an impression of its size. It is large for an inner city building in Amsterdam. By 1970, after years of neglect, there were civic plans for its refurbishment as a theatre. In drawings by the architectural office of P. Zanen, the front is clad in glass and new materials. But at two million guilders, the cost was prohibitive. And there was a cheaper proposal, an idea of its time, for a rough and ready occupation. Late in 1972, it opens as Mickery Theatre, version 2. At Rosengracht, the discoveries made in Learner's Lurt, the appreciations and understandings of alternative processes of production and staging, were formally acknowledged. They informed both the initial structural conversion of the building in 1972 and its later transformations and remodelling. The cinema was gutted. The seats were removed, the floor was levelled, the balcony was bricked in and transformed into the separate 50-seat Bovenzaal studio, and the screen and box stage replaced by the all-purpose alcove, which was used mainly for storage and backstage activities. All this was an intelligent, though fairly ad hoc and basic, response to the existing architectural configuration. And the interior was painted black, or rather, a nondescript brown. Lacking either fixed seating or permanent staging, the main hall, without particular intention or design, represented an early and subsequently really influential example of a black box studio. That supposedly flexible space 
That became a ubiquitous feature of theatre conversions and construction during the late 1960s and early 1970s. The main studio could accommodate 250 people, quote, if we stuff them in sideways. Between 1972 and 1987, this multifunctional space became a vital location of theatrical experiment. It's one of those distinct and un unevenly distributed sites worldwide in which new approaches to form and aesthetics in theatre flourished and in which a particular avant-garde developed. I thought it might be useful, and this is slightly theoretical, but I thought it might be useful at this point to offer some reflections on the nature of the black box. For whatever its origins, by the early 1970s, it was indeed a case of paint it black, often over and over again to maintain the blackness. The appearance of simple, unadorned and unpartitioned rectangular studio spaces was partly, I think, under the influence of the publication in 1968 of the English translation of Yishe Grotowski's Towards a Poor Theatre, with its illustration of his theatre laboratory in Wrocław, with his actors starkly, iconically cut out against the darkness. The plain box seems to be the ideal location for his poor theatre, for theatre that can exist without costume, lighting, etc. Though, for his designer, Yishe Gorowski, it rather provided the opportunity to create new scenic architectures. Gorowski writes, We have resigned from the stage and auditorium plant. For each production, a new space is designed for the actors and spectators. Thus, infinite variations of performer-audience relationships is possible. So, in a unique synthesis of setting, performers, and spectators for each production, complete worlds of people and things then appear, adrift in the deep space of the black box. The black box is also the quintessential implementation of Peter Brook's key propo proposition in The Empty Space, his influential book of 1968. Quote, I can take any empty space and call it a bare stage. So Grotowski and Brooks' proposals become programmatic and the black box is a practical rendition of their particular visions. Here is a space in which the deadly conventional theatre might be resisted, in which new relations of performer and spectator might be enacted. The empty room becomes the site for theatre making rather than the empty stage. UK academic David Wiles regards the desire for flexibility that accompanies the emergence of the black box as an expression of libertarian ideals. For there's a theoretical freedom of choice here to adopt any mode of organising the theatrical microcosm. Here, anything might be possible. The black box allows multiple configurations of seating and with its walls being effectively invisible, lighting can make the space seem as tiny or as expansive as the world might work might desire. Yet despite claims to increase creative freedom, the closed environment of the black box is really dogmatic in its demands. This is a space that lacks the side, rear and overhead facilities of the auditorium. There is no tower for flying scenery in and out, no wings for repeated entrances and exits, no proper backstage. It's a place where little can be hidden, where disguising scenic mechanisms is almost impossible. While seeming to be neut a neutral setting, it immediately reveals any theatrical contrivance set against it. As David Wiles observes, any stage set framed by a black wall is revealed to be mere stage artifice. He goes further. There's nothing neutral about blackness. 
the black box constitutes a closed environment that encourages abstraction and risks becoming, quote, a depoliticizing space. The individual performer character is presented as being cut out of social and environmental context, perfectly individualized and constantly visible, his or her motives and actions laid bare in plain view. Which is why, perhaps more recently, site-specific and immersive performance occupying real-world and communal situations eventually appear as a reaction to the black box. Does the black box then facilitate or necessitate new ways of inhabiting theatrical space with new approaches to staging and to performing? Is there again a chicken and egg relationship? Practically, as the so-called fourth wall of the scenic stage disappears, there's an impact upon expressive technique. Performers are now frequently on stage and in full view for the duration of the work and in close proximity. With neither wings nor backstage, there's nowhere for them to go. So they turn and address the audience directly, implicitly admitting that we're all here gathered in the here and now and acknowledging the limits of simulation here, rather than being effectively overheard addressing each other in a scenic approximation of the domestic everyday. You'll notice how often in my photographs, performers face us directly. So as the key dramatic characters, the accent is, is thrown upon the uninterrupted presence and advanced resources of the performers upon their skills, though these are now often in unfamiliar tones and registers, and upon direct engagement of the audience. Enabled through new spatial relationships, the audience is often arranged formally, positioned obliquely, invited to participate actively. In Mickery's Black Box, we glimpse the origins and subsequent development of a particular set of signature practices from the earliest expressions of physical theater through the, ad uh, sorry, through the ad adoption and integration of media and increasing technological and scenographic uh, elaboration to the eventual fracturing of narrative structures and reordering of dramatic hierarchies in what Hans T. Sleiman has called the post-dramatic. In its architecture and fabric, we discern, we discern the material conditions that facilitated and nurtured the emergence and evolution of specific innovations in performance and in its, and in its re reception of light. Mickery played a major role in inspiring the growth of an alternative ecology of production and distribution. However, we might note a final thought from David Wiles who regards the black box now as, quote, an historically specific architectural statement that has become, quote, and I fear saying this here, a piece of historical baggage that contemporary practice must struggle to accommodate. Okay. In its 25-year history at Lerner's Lert and Rosengrach, Mickery presented 800 productions and events, 120 from the US. In its programming, it cleverly built relationships with affluent festivals, such as Nancy and Avignon, bringing visiting companies on to Amsterdam and organizing further touring from them in the Netherlands and in Europe. The annual seasons at Mickery exposed Dutch audiences to significant radical performances that demanded of them equally new ways of looking, of experiencing, and of responding, often through their physical reconfiguration in the theatre. And this was achieved and enhanced, I want to suggest, by four successive and fundamental reconfigurations of the available space. And this is my main point. Uh, this evening.
So the first of these configurations tackled the simple question of how to position, organize, and orientate both the performance and its spectators in an empty space. How to juxtapose action and viewpoint in a room without either assigned stage or auditorium. Basically, a space without a front or a back. Ritzart Tenkata's initial solution to this, the so-called Mickery modules. And you can see the, created by industrial designer Franz de la Haye, they were a practical response to arranging the audience, to preserving intimacy, and to facilitating flexibility through a non-invasive solution. I don't want to touch that beautiful empty space, De La Haye told me. Of his approach to design, he noted, you look at the sight lines, oh, sorry, you look at the lines of sight in different configurations. From that, you derive a certain matrix of dimensions, the space between seats not too far apart. People should be relatively close, touching basically, because that creates also another effect in the audience. And also it should be possible to remove the whole thing and store it somewhere very compactly. Each module consisted of a folding plywood box with hinges at the corners and a removable top. The basic shape was to be square, but this was eventually doubled to make a rectangle, 1.83 meters, times 91 centimeters with a height of 30 centimeters, including the lid. Sorry, uh, that means nothing to you. The point being, all of those are standard dimensions that you could buy at the timber merchant. Okay, there's no cutting involved in building the, uh, these things. They're standard off the shelf dimensions that made them economic to purchase as well as easy to manipulate. The resulting modules were painted black with circular holes cut in the sides for ease of, of assembly, for feeding scaffolding tubes to build bridges, and for affixing steps for access. The corner hinges protruded, enabling the building of different heights and combinations as each slotted into the box above. For the seats, he used an existing plastic shell on a newly designed frame that allowed units of three chairs to be pressed together under tension and then pushed down into specially drilled square holes, preventing movement and ensuring rigidity. And these holes could also serve a number of purposes, such as attaching railings and feeding cables for lighting. Arranged and stacked in different configurations for each production, the modules could be used for seating and staging alike. They offered a variety of options to visiting companies who could also employ them in performance. Here's the Pip Simmons group in 1972 performing the George Jackson black and white minstrel show in which, quote, you are spared nothing. The performers approach you with butcher's knives and handcuffs. Firecrackers explode all around you. Bananas fly about. And here's Rat Theatre, the company of which I was a member in 1973 with the, the modules in the background. And here are some of the original square modules in one of the so-called Bovenzal discussions program of events in 1982. So this is the small upstairs studio. Such adaptability would become the default requirement of studio theaters worldwide. But I want to suggest that it originated at Mickery. Similar module systems would become, an es would become essential in situations, quote, where you want to have a total control of where your audience is. There was a former Mickery stage manager commented to me, flexibility is hated by those who have to do it. Here, incidentally, our friends, oh, oh yeah, okay. Um, here, incidentally, are Franz de la Haye's latest versions of the Mickery module. Uh, 
I expect they're very, very, very expensive. Anyway. Still okay? Okay. Okay. Um, just as an aside, um, in 1978, um, the performance group uh, from the US in their first performance, their first appearances in Europe offered a kind of alternative approach to occupying the blackness. In the three places in Rhode Island uh, trilogy, Sacanet Point, Rumstick Road, Nyat School, and later Point Judith, um, they confined and framed the productions within distinct architectural scenic settings that resembled self-contained and complete worlds. So, These settings were constructed at Mickery, suggesting a new modus operandi for touring in Europe without the need for prohibitive transport of sets from the US. Incidentally, Spalding Gray developed his storytelling technique in 1980 with three monologues upstairs in the Bovenzaal studio to no more than 30 or 40 people. This would eventually lead to the creation of his famous monologue, Swimming to Cambodia. The second articulation furthered Tenkata's restless, persistent, and sustained attention to questions of spectatorship. In the long-term inquiry entitled, entitled Manipulating the Audience, his next step was to imagine the audience itself in motion. The first fairground project in 1974, presented by the entirely fictitious Concept Theatre of Boston, posed a unique set of problems. Tenkata writes, we have a concept of this play where we move the people in boxes, 25 in a box, split them up, put them in front of plays, different small plays. We create a total disorientation and also make people realize basically that following the order of things is very important. But Franz de la Haye realized that simply putting wheels on the boxes and pushing them around would not work. The combined weight of audience and box would be two metric tons. You would probably go through the floor, he warned. His solution was to enable the boxes to float on air. Not as in a hovercraft where the noise would have been terrific and the amount of downdraft required prohibitive, but on a film of compressed air across the space. We can have everything floating around. You can push it with one finger. One person doesn't need more force to move it. It was a self-regulating system. Air escaping through holes beneath the boxes met the resistance of a kind of sheet of air on the floor. It was a major technical achievement with air piped in from large compressors standing outside on Rosengracht, Mickery in motion. In these untitled photographs, I think we see early experiments, the immobile boxes standing in the space as the complexities of stage management are rehearsed. And Ritzart Tankata himself lost in thought wondering if any of this is going to work. The one essential was to seal the floor, covering the whole area with thin boards to prevent air escaping noisily and potentially catastrophically through cracks. Occasionally boxes did have technical problems and audiences had to remove their shoes and leave quietly so as not to damage the delicate surface during their exit. Closed off during the frequent phases of movement, their curtains, the curtains on the boxes were opened to reveal short scenes that were variously comic, upbeat, and more serious in content. Sometimes blocks of audiences were pushed to face each other with dramatic action located between them and with their varying responses apparent in each other's sightlines. 
all different blocks witness different scenes in different sequences and combinations, or indeed totally different scenes altogether. In the final moment, the four boxes were arranged in a row facing a single cello player lit from above. The experience was deeply disorientating. You thought there was a huge space moving around. One significant repercussion, and I think this is important, was to throw audiences into conversation after the event. Who had seen what? In what order? What did they understand of the narrative? What might be gleaned to inform interpretation? through discussion of different experiences. This technology was employed on three further occasions. In 1978, Tenjo Sajiki, Suji Teriyama's company from Tokyo, created Cloud Cuckoo Land. Though no video recording survives, I think we can begin to imagine the production to some extent through a combination of surviving ground plans of the gridded theater floor marking the success, successive positions of boxes through technical documents showing what happens where and when, and through the published dossier on the production with the description of scenes. This is another uh, one of the research dossiers that, that Mickery began to publish on individual productions. Um, also through the recollections of the stage manager, who was effectively a traffic controller overseeing the movement of the boxes from a high perch, instructing the stage crew on radio headsets and directing the opening and closing of curtains. And through the model box or maquette, in combination with time plots of the action, it enables us, I think, to begin to appreciate the choreographic complexities of the production and the changing relationship of action and audiences as we move the units. Mickery as a board game, perhaps. But then, in Fairground 84, each box held 65 spectators. The units were now converted shipping containers, far too large for the Mickery building itself. The audience was charged with sharing, quote, the responsibility for the origin of what is new. The chief aim was, quote, the deconditioning and activation of our awareness of the reality of the theatre, of the impact theatre may have on us. A final manifestation, The History of Theatre Part Two, was staged in 1988 in a dockside warehouse in Rotterdam. Productions were beginning to outgrow the limitations of the black box. Mickery was always stretched at the seams. In 1976, Mabu Mines, the saint and the football player, filled almost the entire main space. And in 1982, for Richard Foreman's Café Amérique, 60 spectators had to be crammed into the specially opened alcove. On the other hand, however, in 1975, the main space was just too large for Robbie Anton's Eat Home in which he manipulated tiny puppets for an audience of 15 pressed close to the tabletop action. It was instead performed in Tenkata's office. In the third articulation in 1977, these contrasting spatial limitations and possibilities were acknowledged as the whole building became the setting for performance in Pip Simmons' version of Edgar Allan Poe's Mask of the Red Death. The audience was ushered through several connecting locations in Mickery for 11 scenes, commencing with Poe in bed in the foyer bar. The main, the main space was rigged with large, movable, transparent screens that were used for, for projections that were lowered to enable the audience to watch the minuet scene through the screens that were raised to admit them into the ranter's room and that were lowered to entrap them in the room of the flagellants. The audience viewed scenes from gallery walkways above and they proceeded into the rear yard where Poe was buried in a coffin with a glass lid 
along with live rats. In the wake scene, they danced with performers before the Red Death appeared to lead the massed revelers out. As Simmons noted, you had a narrative progression through the rooms. We re-edited the play to make a narrative progression. The production included, well, as usual with Pip Simmons, much nudity. Uh, Poe and his child Bride were covered in custard. Poe was scrubbed on the mortician slab. And there were horror effects, including a dead rabbit in a miniature coffin. The audience as witnesses to lust and debauchery in the castle of Prince Prospero or Edgar Allan Poe were dressed throughout in white hooded cloaks and masks. We would be happy if you wear your capes throughout the performance, as you are therefore identified as a reveller, and those without may have crept in secretly to infect us, read the program. Incidentally, uh, Simmons immediately followed this project with a residency in Chapter Arts Centre, a converted school in my home city of Cardiff, that resulted in a version of George Buchner's um, Wojtzeck, which was staged throughout the school building and also here in the yard. Mickery was never quite a featureless rectangular black box. It was always haunted by its past as a cinema. The conversion of the early 1970s and its subsequent uses never totally destroyed or obscured its architectural details, the traces of its previous function and its underlying identity were still apparent. And in a fourth spatial address, its original features and layouts were once more recovered and revealed. The Bovenzaal balcony wall was demolished and a separate video room was added beneath it. The alcove was opened and a pit was dug in the floor of the main studio. The placement of audiences was now informed by this reordered interior. In a series of axonometric plans for Mickery three-dimensional, Tenkata outlines different structural reconfigurations of the number of adjoining but discrete spaces. Though in these drawings, it's difficult to distinguish what was actually achieved from what was hypothetical and programmatic. Quote, each space was visually connected by soundproof windows, creating sightline restric restrictions we could manipulate, Tenkata wrote. Audiences could now be separated and dispersed, and action distributed to different locations. The whole building becomes a theatre machine, offering a variety of displacements of watchers and those watched, of activities and viewpoints. Or more exactly, Given Tenkata's previous profession in television, a media studio, as he became concerned with the implications of television for live performance. Television and its procedures become a co determinant of theatre production and staging. Of the Making Theatre Beyond Television project, Tenkata writes The creation of a dramaturgically constructed event in which the audience, the performers, and the presence of the media should function as equals. Bits and pieces of a world which seem to be changing faster than we can adjust to, translated into a new theatre discipline. Television is used as a light source, as a carrier of information, as another character in a production, for the sound of its white noise and other of its translated characteristics. Performance was here self-evidently being made. One key influence, I think, was the Wooster Group, which had a long-term, though not always harmonious, relationship with Mickery. The Wooster Group came out of the Performance Group. Wooster Group, oh, sorry, Wooster Group grew out of the Performance Group and presented 11 productions at Mickery, including the controversial Route 1 and 9 performed in Black Space. There was an easy translation between the performing garage in, in New York and also La Mama and Mickery. They were all of similar size and shape, reinforcing the notion of a network of similar locales worldwide dedicated to the manufacture and exchange of performance. 
The Worcester Group's main aesthetic proposition had a profound effect. Simply, if the black box reveals all theatrical artifice, then why not play on that artifice? With all technological means revealed and on view, with the integration of different media, Route 1 and 9 included a video recording, for instance, of Thornton Wilder's Our Town, and with constant shifting between acting styles, including registers adopted from film and television. In the early 1980s, Tenkata perceptively prefigured the onset of digital modes of registration and apprehension in a series of Mickery produced multimedia works through the overlay of different orders of mediated material viewed by separate audiences in the theater's new various spaces, each group witnessing fundamental different interpretations of action and mediated material. In the Ballista of 1984, developed with Pip Simmons from Franz Kafka's In the Penal Colony, the focus was a full-size replica of the Roman catapult. Audiences were offered a choice of three tickets. After witnessing a demonstration of the weapon shattering a sheet of glass, those who had chosen the studio floor were interviewed by a television crew on their opinions of this anachronistic instrument, now become an art object. It then became apparent that they were actually involved in an execution, the real purpose of the ballista, with associated media coverage. They themselves invited to offer box pop opinions. In a sudden reversal, the reporter was asked her own opinions. First, she claimed the need to remain objective, but finally admitted her opposition to the death penalty. As a consequence of his own unshakable beliefs, the presiding general finally offered to take the penalty. The audience in the new video room, which was sited under the balcony in the former rear stalls, saw the event through a glass window and on five playback monitors. They could choose either to watch the live performance or a selected edit from the several cameras with close-ups, interviews with studio audience, etc., or a self-authored mix of the two. The audience in the former enclosed Bovenzaal could only see mediated material and the process of editing itself as if they were in a broadcast control room. Of major importance amongst Mickery's own production was Tenkata's autobiographical work, Rembrandt and Hitler or Me, A Journey Not a Destination of 1975. He termed it, quote, an architectural piece. The performance takes place for three audience groups simultaneously. One of the audience groups is seated in the performance space itself. The other two audiences are seated in adjoining spaces which are connected to the performance space by large picture windows, seven and a half meters long by two and a half meters high. These spaces are soundproofed and have an entirely different soundtrack than the main space. This separation of the audience is an essential conceptual element of the performance. In Rembrandt, a recording of Ronald Reagan's State of the Union address was accompanied by a 45 minute opera ovation from Bayreuth, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights with the soundtrack from Apocalypse Now. There were rows of replica terracotta Chinese uh, warriors, an interview with a Holocaust survivor, Bugs Bunny cartoons. In these productions, the singular theater object, the well-made play completely disappears. Performance becomes dispersed as a field of different affects. Theatrical composition becomes a mix or mashup. Projected images were seen both large and small on backdrops, on moving screens, on rows of monitors, reflecting on windows. Confined audiences witnessed privileged video footage or heard separate soundtracks to that which they overlooked. The juxtapositions, repetitions, and interpenetrations of dramatic material and its reception that such arrangements assist and make possible, anticipate familiar functions of digital media, 
montage, multiplicity, simultaneity. In Mickery, they were conspired by analog means, above all spatially, architectronically. The building itself recommended and engendered dramaturgical sophistication. Quote, three simultaneous performances provided different experiences of the same content. In this complex arrangement of images, soundtracks, text, time is a major organizing principle. Dramatic material is arranged against and over time to ensure complex synchronicities of the live, the mediated, and the pre-recorded. And there's a growing sense of the individual spectator taking responsibility for negotiating their way through material that is half heard, overheard, caught out of the corner of the eye as a new kind of subject viewer. Again, in a pre-echo of the contemporary experience of individual and screen of multi-platform participation. As Tenkata observed, Mickery becomes a place and time machine. In the 1980s, in parallel with his own mediated productions and support of the Wooster Group, Mickery championed the work of a new generation of European companies, principally those from an energized indigenous Dutch-Belgian scene. Tenkata became an advocate of director Jan Lauer's and Need Company, and of the next generation of US artists, including Peter Sellers, who's a Ajax or Ajax in 1987 was one of Mickery's last co-productions. And Mickery began to employ its considerable production and technical expertise to stage works beyond Rosengracht. In 1989, my own company, Breithgau, presented Godothin in an empty ice rink in Leewarden in Friesland. The scenography included 8,000 sandbags and 100 trees that were brought in from Germany. But after 25 years, I think the pressures of programming, not least financial, were taking their toll. Finally, in 1990, Mickery closed its operations with the Touch Time Festival at a variety of venues in the city centre, with a programme that included the Wooster Group's Brace Up, based on Chekhov's Three Sisters, and John Malpede's LAPD Inspects Amsterdam. And that was that. Ritzart Tenkata went on to found the Das Arts Artist Training Program, and in the last 10 years of his life, to become a visual artist. And Mickery itself was once again gutted and converted. In Lunaslut and then in Rosengracht, Mickery had the capacity to rearrange action and its viewpoints, and to nurture and accommodate acts of theatre that commenced with the empty space rather than the empty stage. In encountering the practical problems and creative opportunities of the two spaces, it fostered practices and forms that are now commonplace, but have their origins in places like Mickery. As a postscript, there was neither stage door nor rear exit at Rosengracht. Artists had to enter and exit through the bar in the foyer where they encountered their audience. And it was this feature that engendered a unique sociability at Mickery, a place where theatre was made, presented, and above all, talked about. And it's this that most artists and their audiences remember most clearly. That's quite long. Sorry. <coughs> no, no. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, I wonder if someone has questions, commentaries, or something, or want to say something about this <laughs> big. Uh, trip. <laughs> well, I myself, I'm still organizing thoughts, actually. Um, 
two minutes. I can't see anybody. <laughs> Maybe I need to. Oh, I need to stay on the. I I would like to know something more about um, the Mikri research dossiers and and the publications. The yeah, magazine yeah. zines. Well, I want to know much more about a lot of things, but that was one of the things I've noticed. Yeah. What is to publish a research dossier, and what kind of things would they publish? Okay, um, they um, published dossiers on individual productions that were designed in the space, so to demonstrate how a particular company had had used the space uh, in detail so there's one for pip simmons mask of the red death there's one for uh tenjo sajiki's cloud cuckoo land um these are, are like uh, they're not really scripts they're production documents for devised performance i think that's what makes them very unique um so you get production details as well as text um, and photographs of production and so on and so on. Uh, and there were uh, people could buy them yeah, outside. Absolutely. I was wondering because, for instance, the theater that inhabited this place before you used to have a big programs with a lot of information, text, image, with a lot of references for each performance. So yeah. I was wondering this idea of presenting a dossier of something that was. Yeah, there were there was also a very long term uh, inquiry into audiences. Um, um, uh, you know, and although we're talking about major practices, in fact, Ritzat Tenkata was a spectator, uh, and he wanted Dutch audiences to see provocative work. He wanted to provoke them. And I think then he was interested in the result of that provocation. Uh, you know, what audience responses actually actually were. How was that inquire? Um, so it was a document or uh, what yeah, kind it was of? Another of this, uh, yeah, uh, um, it was another of these dossier. Uh, it became a dossier. Uh, um, Kind of question. Oh, I'm also interested in like what kind of conversation do you do you establish with an audience, and how do what kind of questions and concerning well, which production? I th it may sound stupid this thing about the bar, but I think it was fundamental at Mickery. You could only get in and out through the bar. Um, there was nowhere for performers to escape out of the side, so. The audience would be there, if you will, if if you came out. And so I think there was a the other idea of really talking about about performance of of what had just been achieved was was a very was very significant at certainly at Rosengraft. Yeah. Thank you. No, no. Yeah, um, well, well, I'll continue if no one no, asks. So, as we have seen here, Mikiri Theatre uh, underwent uh, several, several changes throughout times. So I was wondering what is the relationship of the, uh, the refashioning of the space in relation to the funds that were or were not available during each period? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, Ritzat Tenkata, as I said, was a member of a uh, very wealthy uh, textile company. Uh, I think Ajax football team used to have Tenkata on their on their shirt. I think maybe. Um, and although he didn't have a lot of money himself, he was very, very, very well connected. 
in Dutch society. So he, he could always locate money, I think, for, for projects in a way that we would not be able to. Um, you know, he knew the Queen. Uh, I mean, that's a... Uh, um, but I think the the... He always took care of artists. So this was, so maybe, as I said at the beginning, uh, companies were paid well to, to be at Mickery uh, and then took that money and used it to make work uh, else, elsewhere. Um, I'm not sure where the money came from for the initial conversion. Um, but he, again, he was very, um, I think he persuaded the city council that this was a good idea uh, and much, much cheaper than, uh, you know, this official conversion uh, that they were considering. Yeah. That's not, yeah. Mikuri would work as a private theater, as a pub. What was the relation with the state money, city council money? How with, with what? Right? Uh, at Mikuri yeah. would would be a private project, or how would it work? Yeah, I, yeah, I think it was. Um, uh, I don't know how state funding worked at that time. Uh, in in the Netherlands, but uh, I think it was set up as a as a private initiative. Um, but then it, it very quickly became kind of fundamentally part of the Dutch scene. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, then maybe I, I'm also interested in this um, how it changes. You, you said. Ritsa Tenkat was a spectator and ha he has this relation with TV and and how how would then he work as um, a programmer and then a pedagogue or creating a school so how what, what how do you how do you think he would approach these different roles or how yeah how do we you envisage I'm not entirely sure um I'm really interested um, in the response of audiences in this final phase where you could buy different kinds of ticket. Um, but then maybe one ticket, you could only see the work on video or you could only see it with the soundtrack from Apocalypse Now on video. Um, you know, and, and whether, um, how audiences began to cope with that, um, you know, rather than being down in the, in the theater with, with, uh, what seems to be the action. Um, but we, we constantly have to remember, you know, you constantly have to remember this was 1980. 1980 or whatever. You know, this is all analog technology. It's all everything's analog here. Uh, so maybe I, I was not so, so clear. I, I'm also interested in trying to understand um, late, uh, like late years of Hitler and Cat, and also how it goes into programming in the 80s and like IETM and how. Like how from Mikuri suddenly then there is a European scene and yeah, a European yeah, circuit yeah, yeah. being created and growing yeah. up from that. I mean, I, I think in the first period, um, maybe up to 1975, so from the late 60s to 1975, Mikuri is in the import business. That's for sure. Uh, 
It's about bringing uh, work, uh, staging work. Um, it, it's very selective about the kind of work it wants. You know, he's 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 very particular. Um, and then in 1978, Mickery begins to make its own work. So it becomes a, a kind of producer of work as well as just as just this importer, uh, a producer of its own work, but also a producer of of the work of the, the the work of others. And I think that maybe was the the, the fundamental change uh, in in attitude then. Um, but I think he was very Ritzat Tenkata was very um, what's the word seductive? Well, maybe not seductive, but he could he could um, convince other promoters around Europe to take work. So I think he he you begin to see circuits of work. Uh, beginning to to develop um, and I, I I think the the festivals at Nancy and Avignon or particularly Nancy maybe are really fundamental in this so companies come there they make their reputation and then they be then they become part of the circuit yeah yeah Some become part of the circuit. Mike, could you tell us a little bit about your experience uh, presenting at Mikery with um, a brief cost? Uh, how did you get there? Yeah. There was clearly no Facebook at the time, to so a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, so uh, personally, uh, I performed. Um, yeah, I was with a very, very, very violent company called Rap Theatre. Uh, I'm really violent. Um, in 1973, and we were invited to the Nancy Festival. And we were just four guys. And suddenly you become kind of famous. Uh, and and um, uh, and Tenkata asked us to come to Mikri. Uh, with this work, so I had that early contact, and then we, the groups that I was involved in, never performed uh, Mickery until right at the end. Um, and it's a strange story, um, but we, in 1988, uh, we made the the first in a series of large scale site specific works we made it in a an empty car factory in cardiff it's a work called gododin we made it with an industrial percussion group called test department who were kind of big at the time um, and we made it end of 1988 um, and that it went very well i mean it was Okay, and then what happened? Um, Margaret Thatcher suddenly became worried about French cultural hegemony in Europe, right? And she needed British culture to be visible in Europe immediately. Uh, and so the British Council. The British Council turned to people they knew and said, um, have you got anything? And we said, well, we've got this big scale site work. Um, and so they gave us a lot of money. I mean, if Margaret Thatcher knew the politics of this work, we would never, we wouldn't have been good. Um, but what, what happened was that uh, we were able to Offer the work to different different promoters in Europe, and we went to see Ritzart, and Ritzart said, "Yes, Mickery will do it." I think he was just 
really falling out now of 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 the theater on Rosengracht. It was he was something different, really. Um, but he said, we won't do it in Amsterdam. Uh, we'll do it in Friesland, right in the north, where, of course, there's a cultural linguistic minority. Um, and we'll do it in an empty ice hockey stadium. Uh, and so those were all his initiatives, really. Um, and it was great. Um, because I think it was, it it kind of de demonstrated Mickery's technical and promotional expertise at a very high level, um, and um, yeah. But it was almost the last. Maybe it was the last Mickery co-production before the final festival. Yeah. It's interesting to, to think about uh, what you were saying about Margaret Thatcher and all of that. If we think on the 1980s and in France, it, from the 7th to the 80s, it's, the, it's when Europe starts really starts to invest in culture. Yeah, yeah, and it's really a moment where it is important to build a Europe of culture. So then it's when a lot of uh, programs start um, for the arts, and <clears throat> it's when you'll have Jacques Lang in yeah, France yeah, yeah. sponsoring a lot of like culture to be present. All over. so I, I I can't imagine Margaret Thatcher is is responding to Jack Lang's politics and to to all of this. So it's interesting to see how a series of um, um, countercultural performance is very critical. Suddenly, uh, in the 1980s and in the early 90s, are it's when Europe needs to show a culture around. Sometimes, a bit to, as you were saying, without knowing, picks up these things and put them to circulate. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, those early days. Uh, are really interesting because it goes from the internationalism of the artists at start, then to a sponsoring of this internationalism of the artists to an to this craziness of internationalization. Yeah. So yeah, I think yeah. there is this. It's kind of a shift if you think of it, and I think it's important to understand where we are now. Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sorry, I was. Uh, I should shouldn't do it like this, but anyway. Um, <laughs> This is just to remind you what you just saw. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these people, you know, you know, th this is where it came from, you know, and these people really were not thinking about subsidy or. Uh, yeah, I think it was there was a, yeah. And I think the, but I think those, the circuits were often sort of self-help circuits or, I mean, the one thing that, that we capitalized on in, in Britain was actually European, uh, was, sorry, sorry, was, was university touring. So actually we were, um, we were almost following rock band touring at that time. It was almost the same, uh, you know, as I say, one night stands. Um, and it wasn't subsidized work, really. Uh, and then, of course, certain groups get subsidized. And uh, yeah, I mean. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, this is moving big. I d that's the director who I meet every other day virtually in Cardiff. Um, I don't know. It, it, it. Albert Hunt, the UK uh, critic, uh, wrote a book called Hopes for Great Happenings, and I, I, I always look at a photo like that and think. 
they've, they've got hopes for great happenings. One last question is, yeah. how does me, and what about Nina Simone? How come, like the, the initial <laughs> programming of me? <laughs> I, I suspect Ritzart just liked her and 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 was able to 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 organize this concert. Uh, uh, I mean, the inst I, I think the the situation with Ellen Stewart and La Mama was quite different. I think. Alan Stewart got in touch and said, "We're coming." That was, uh, you know, she they'd heard about this venue and and uh, yeah. But how any of that happened without text or email or uh, I still I still can't imagine how we organised gigs. I, I honestly honestly now. How does the project end? In which circumstance? Sorry. In, in in which circumstance? How do this project ends? How does it end? Yes. I mean, I mean the, the theater, What's the meekest theater. It's my hearing. Sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, the the, the meekest theater. How does it end? Does it still exist? No, it doesn't exist. So. Yeah, I think so. Well, uh, I, I think the. I think um, the the theater. Um, I think it 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 takes what it wants. Um, I mean, I've, I've there's a black box here. I'm interested how that black box is is still used. Um, but um, I mean, what's really been interesting for us is um, we had no national theatre in Wales, we had no national theatre. Uh, and then suddenly we got two, which is very strange. One Welsh and Welsh language national theatre and one. Um, and since 2010, I've made three big productions with them because they realized that this work we did in the 80s could still be useful particularly the site specific work so it got a new life in a national theater which is extraordinary really yeah and why do you think there are two national theatres now. Why? Why are there two national <laughs> yes. theatres? Um, well, because um, the Welsh language national theatre was the first organisation. But of course, when you when you work in a minority language, then <coughs> theatre has a particular kind of set of responsibilities mm -hmm. to be a guardian of the language to show good language practice mm -hmm. if you like i guess whether whether you you believe that or not um and i think it very quickly became a, a particular kind of thing uh and then there was a pressure um, for the english language equivalent which is great that it was that way around, in fact. Mm. Um, but. And, and why would experimental theatre of the 70s, 80s, well, late yeah. 60s to uh, early 80s fit in the national theatre in 2020? Um, I think it was the vision of the first director mm. of the national theatre. But in the very first, in the very first season, well, sorry. So he had a comp he had the concept of a national theatre that has no theatre building, mm. that has no permanent repertory company, uh, and that is more like a production house. But in the very first year, in 2010, 
he had the idea of staging 12 performances in 12 different locations in the in the country one per month uh, which was an extraordinary effort so they have a, an experimental national theater yeah so exactly exactly <laughs> then I... yeah but then he went back to i think he he thought about some of those old practices that might still work so uh, you know the large scale site work might still be away um and for the very first production we did um we made a production of Aeschylus's the Persians but in a, a replica village that the British army has built to rehearse urban warfare yeah <laughs> we knew how to do that we would never never get permission from the british army but a national theater can so that began to be interesting of course and well thinking of these replica buildings made for armies to practice and to train um well i think you can look at that through a performance studies point of view yeah, yeah. and um one of maybe my final question i don't know could be um how would you how how would you make a parallel between all these experiences in europe and the micro theater and theorizations such as the notion of environmental theater and and the early well the beginning of performance studies i'm thinking for instance in points of contact between theater and anthropology and yeah, yeah. and texts yeah. like this so this this approach the uh, performance studies point of view well i mean it's strange for me because um you know as a student and when i was beginning to see work uh that interested me of course the performance group was richard schechner's group so you, really right at the beginning there's there's a, 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 a connection between creative creative work and some kind of theoretical uh, take on on that work so i think we were we were aware of schechner from really early on so even before performance studies became fine became a thing uh we were reading Schechner's early books and and so on so and i think it it was all feeding into that scene i don't know if we have more questions <laughs> maybe well, I thought we don't have more questions. Maybe some final comments. Some final comments. Well, um, Thank you. I've been very, very ill for two weeks. <laughs> so um, I'm delighted to get through the, the presentation. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I hope it was of some interest. Uh, I think I think my main my main point is um, never to to take for granted the things that we do or to make assumptions about conditions they had their origins somewhere they're not just common sense they they do have their origins uh, and i think it's useful to keep an eye on those those origins because we we may learn more and more of, of yeah to inspire our contemporary work yeah i'm i'm really i'm not interested in a sort of nostalgia for a lost world what i am interested in is whether whether there's anything here that might inspire contemporary practice really yeah thank you i think that's precisely why we invited you yeah. thank you <laughs> thank you so much thank you thank you all thank you